Over 3,800 years ago, Egypt was in crisis. The current pharaoh has died. He has not left any male heirs to follow. What was to happen? Foreigners to the north had already started arriving in Egypt, and the land had started to become divided, with independent rulers emerging all over the land. The last glimmer of hope would come from a princess, a daughter of the 12th dynasty pharaoh, Amunemhat III. This woman was the only legitimate heir left to rule. Her name was Sobek Neferu. In an extraordinary break from tradition, she was to set a precedent for all female rulers to come, such as Hatshepsut, the 18th dynasty female pharaoh. For years now, people have credited the incomparable Hatshepsut with being the first female pharaoh. However, this is incorrect. Yes, there were female rulers, from Merineith from the first dynasty to Kent Kawes from the fourth dynasty. However, Sobek Neferu was to be the first to use the title of the daughter of the sun god Ra. Her rule saw many trials and tribulations, and would see the end of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, and the end of the Pyramid Age. She is the first woman who rules as king, staunchly retaining her femininity. She changed the religious belief. She became a pharaoh. Her name means the beautiful one of the crocodile god Sobek. What evidence is there about her connection to these fierce creatures? We know she had temples built in Fayum with mysterious underground chambers. Sobek is a crocodile god. Every opportunity they get, they will try to kill you. But what do we rarely know about the queen's life? Throughout the years, I have investigated many Egyptian queens and their illustrious lives. Now, join me, Curtis Ryan Woodside, in this documentary, Years in the Making, to finally learn more about Sobek Neferu. I have traveled around the world to gather up the crumbs of clues that have been left behind, not only from her life, but also her death. This is the year homework for yeah. the scribes. Lots of unanswered questions. We're going to try and answer them. Who was Sobek Neferu? I come face to face with the only known statue of the Queen left and learn more about not only herself, but her family, her religion, her legacy, the downfall of her dynasty, and her death. Come with me as I investigate the Crocodile Princess. Sobek Neferu, the crocodile princess, shown wearing a nemes. We can see here she is seated on the throne of a king. Clearly, she's wearing a female dress with breasts. Sobek Neferu was a female pharaoh in her own right, possibly the first female pharaoh that we actually can confirm before Hatshepsut. But this bus has disappeared from history. So, where is this bust? I've tracked it down, so come with me to go see it. I've come to Berlin to see something that's connected to this animal right here and an Egyptian queen. It's a piece that's been missing that I'm so excited to see. So, let's go. I'm hoping here in downtown West Berlin to get up close and personal with the only remaining piece of the Crocodile Princess.
This is the Hips Formerai, which has been around for about 200 years, and they have some of the most faithful casts of ancient Egyptian pieces, as well as other masterpieces, such as their beautiful replica of Nefertiti. But today, they have something special for me to see that's not actually on display. Here she is. I'm so excited. I'm like shaking. I know it's only a replica, but this is Queen Sobek Neferu, Pharaoh Sobek Neferu. The reason I'm so excited to see her is because this little bust, there's a full, the full version of this, of this bust was on display in the Altus Egyptian Museum here in Berlin. But when it was bombed in World War II, this statue was destroyed. And this is the only known cast, an exact cast of the statue of the crocodile princess, Sobek Neferu. She's so beautiful. And you can see she's wearing this really interesting sort of nemes. It's pleated. You can tell it's not a wig because the pleats are going across. She's wearing a nemes headdress. And at the top, there's a little hole, a little slit, where the uraeus, the cobra, would have been entered into. Isn't she just a masterpiece? And she, she very much resembles her father. Unlike other Egyptian female rulers, Sobek Neferu kept her femininity and displayed herself as a woman not conforming to the male pharaoh standards. Sobek Neferu is an important figure in ancient Egyptian history because she is the first woman who rules as king. Royal women before her had wielded tremendous amounts of authority. When Pepi II, at the end of the Sixth Dynasty, came to the throne at about the age of six, we know that his mother was heavily involved in the day-to-day -day ruling of the ancient Egyptian government. Queens and princesses continued to be significant in the Twelfth Dynasty, but it was Sobek Nofru who took things a step further and ruled at the pinnacle of the ancient Egyptian state. She became the guarantor of Mont, the mediator between heaven and earth, by tying on a kilt over her dress, taking on that form of royal regalia. She was able to perform rituals in the same way as a male king. For us to learn about Sobek Neferu, we must go back to the start of the 12th dynasty to understand the dynamics at work within Egypt. Amunemhat I, the son of an army general, he succeeded to the throne as the first pharaoh of the 12th dynasty, just shortly after Egypt had been reunified. Amunemhat I, he was to have a long line of prosperous successors, like his son, Sesostris I, he pushed Egypt's borders wider to the north and south, invading Nubia twice and Canaan on occasion. It's from Sesostris I that we get the tale of Sinue. The scribe Sinue wrote that Sesostris I had to be rushed back to Egypt during an invasion in Libya after his father, Amunemhat I, had been assassinated. Many copies of the tale of Sinue are still intact. Dr. Sahar Salim has brought me to the Nemec to show me one of these ancient copies. This is the tale of uh, Sinuhi, yes. when uh, uh, Amnon the I uh, was, was killed yeah. and he fled to the Levant yeah. and uh, he wrote his, his, his story and his, his adventure yeah. uh, while he, he, was, uh, he was there. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah, despite of that, it, it took place uh, earlier. We still have uh, copies of them, of, of it till the New Kingdom. Yes. Because you know that this, this, this tale was the homework for the students yeah. uh, in school in ancient Egypt for the scribe. 
So, so this was the, the prescribed literature. Of yes, so this, this is this is their homework uh, yeah. to do. So this is a, 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 a later uh, copy. This yes. is the 19th dynasty uh, copy of uh, the earlier uh, story from yeah. the time of uh, the Middle Kingdom. It's amazing because it's illustrated as well. We have small images showing different gods and different events. Yes, yes. this is the uh, homework for yeah. the scribes and uh, this one seemed to be a good one. Those poor children, they couldn't even escape homework 3,400 uh -huh. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it is also from the reign of Sesostris I that we get a monumental display of the pharaoh's power and the wealth of the country. So, Curtis, where are you taking me? I am taking you an hour out of Cairo today mm -hmm. um, to a site called Heliopolis, okay. which is place of the sun. Okay. And we're going to see one of the oldest obelisks that's still standing in Egypt. That's exciting. Sesostris I left his imposing mark here. This is the oldest giant sized obelisk erected back in 1971 BC. Kaylee, this is the obelisk of Sesostris I. Mm -hmm. He felt he was blessed from the sun god Ra. Yeah. And he built a temple here dedicated to the sun and erected this giant obelisk. Well, it is at least giant. It is, it is. Although when I look at the top, the inscribings are much clearer than at the bottom. You're right, yeah. So I feel like there is a possibility that it either was below sand mm -hmm. and therefore eroded a lot more. Because normally you would suggest that the top would be eroded more because of the sand. Like from vandals. From vandals. And, and, and I think it's got a reconstruction phase going on as well when exactly. I look at it. There's a little bit of chipping happening yeah. around the center as if exactly. some names were changed. Yeah. Which is interesting because it's it's still Sinusert, so maybe this obelisk might have been started by his father. That's a big possibility, big for possibility. sure. Lots of unanswered questions. But we're going to try and answer them. Exactly. Strong, militaristic rulers would follow Sesostris I, such as Amunemhat II and Sesostris II, leading up to the greatest ruler of the 12th dynasty, Sesostris III. This ruthless warrior is often shown with a displeased look on his face, probably considered the most powerful pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. Sesostris III expanded Egypt's empire and kept their enemies at bay. Building forts up and down the land, he maintained Egypt's control in Nubia, setting the boundaries and leading the way for his son, Amunemhat III. Amunemhat III shared a co-regency with his father, Sesostris III, for near on 20 years. When his father died, he became full pharaoh. Because of his father's exceptional military campaigns, Amunemhat inherited a peaceful Egypt. His reign would see a period of peace and stability for many years. Amunemhat III, the father of Sobek Neferu, the father of the first ever recorded female pharaoh and he's so beautiful he's done in this 12th dynasty style and you can see he's got those frown lines pretty similar to Sesostris III. This statue has been changed many times over its lifetime probably created first by Sesostris then adapted to Amunemhat III and even on the side we have the names of Ramses II and his son the 13th son Merenbeta. Only one military battle is attested to this king. In the ninth year of his reign, he went down into Nubia and conquered Semna after a revolt 
from a small population down there, but this is only mentioned on a crude rock inscription. However, his reign appears to be one of prosperity. Amunemhat then focused his attention toward improving agricultural infrastructure and building projects. He started to turn towards the Fayum Oasis. He constructed a temple out in the desert. Now named Medinet Mahdi. It was here that he housed a select group of women. Women whose role was to pleasure the pharaoh. They were the harem of the king. Specially selected women, sometimes the role was handed down from mother to daughter. They lived out in Fayum. These women were always unique and beautiful. They were treated well by the pharaoh, who expected certain entertainment back as gratitude. Amunimhat is well documented for his visits to the harem in Fayum. However, Amunimhat did have three principal wives. It would have to be a child from one of these three queens who would be chosen to be the successor. Children from the harem were more than often not officially listed. Amunimhat had six official listed children. Amunemhat is of course the father of Sobek Neferu, and she is written as one of the officially recognized children of the pharaoh. We do not know the name of Sobek Neferu's mother, but this is not uncommon. The third wife's identity of Amunemhat is also not known. She could be the mother of Sobek Neferu. At the time, the world that Sobek Neferu grew up in is one of abundance and opulence. The country was thriving. The Nile's flood was stable, resulting in fertile crops. Egypt was almost like a paradise. Sobek Neferu's father had led several expeditions to the land of Punt, bringing back many sought-after items. Gemstones were being mined throughout the land and beyond. People all around were living pretty stable and flourishing lives. Many of the furniture pieces from this period are some of the finest of all antiquity. Imagine Sobek Neferu probably used items like this, or even better, in her everyday life. The gold mines were also overflowing. Some of the finest jewelry is from the 12th dynasty. Delicately crafted with superb details, inlaid with colorful stones. Many show charms attached of the gods. This pectoral necklace belonged to Amunemhat III, gifted to one of his sisters and buried with her. We can see the king smiting enemies, mirrored perfectly. On another, Pharaoh Amunimhat appears as a sphinx, capturing his foe. Many of these items belonged to Amunimhat and his family. This gold and beaded necklace was found in the tomb of Neferu Ptah, the daughter of Amunimhat and the eldest sister of Sobek Neferu. In Amunemhat III's 45-year-long reign, he doesn't appear to have many legitimate sons, and it was Neferu Ptah who was being trained to become the next pharaoh, not Sobek Neferu. However, Neferu Ptah had an untimely death, leaving a slight problem in the line of succession. Towards the end of Amunemhat III's reign, he installs a co-regent, his only listed son, Amunemhat IV. Although it does appear that Amunemhat IV's mother may have been a woman from the harem, her name was Hetepi. 
she is only named as Amunemhat the Fourth's mother, and never as the wife of the previous pharaoh at the temple in Fayum. Amunemhat the Fourth may not have been one hundred percent legitimate. Thus, he married his half sister Sobek Neferu. This interfamilial marriage was not something strange to the ancient Egyptians. Sobek Neferu. How much do we know about? I, we know the, very little about her. Yeah, we know very. We know just some evidence that she ruled. That's what we know. She changed the religious belief. She became a pharaoh, and that's why her monuments were completely destroyed. Yeah. Women held much power, and a woman coming from a pure bloodline could somehow add value to a male ruler. Women were often brought. Right to the forefront in times of great crisis. When his father died, Amunemhat the Fourth became full pharaoh. He went on to rule for around nine years. He may have had two sons from another wife. However, when he died, neither of these sons were recognized as rightful successors to the throne. It would be. Sobek Neferu, who became a female pharaoh. Sobek Neferu's rise to the throne was not without its many issues. For the ancients, the pharaoh needed to be a male, for a few simple reasons. Pharaoh was the earthly manifestation of the god Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris. The male pharaoh also had a duty in reproductive roles. Pharaohs were also referred to as the strong bull of his mother Hathor, such as seen on the obelisk of Sesostris. However, women did have many high-ranking positions in ancient Egypt, and under the right circumstances, a woman could become pharaoh. I think this speaks to the flexibility of ancient Egyptian ritual. And while male kingship was the norm, the office of king was male for the ancient Egyptians. These aberrations, these exceptions, these remarkable women like Sobek Nafru and Hatshepsut, and later Tawosret, and even Cleopatra the Seventh, were able to take over that position when the need arose. Particularly in times of strife, at the end of the twelfth dynasty, when there was no better heir to take over, but even in times of prosperity, like the reign of Hatshepsut. So Sobek Nafru really provides this key in ancient Egyptian history to understanding the power that royal women could wield. In the Louvre in Paris, among the thousands of ancient Egyptian items, between the many 12th Dynasty artifacts, almost hidden away, there is the remnants of a statue of Sobek Neferu that shows her as a pharaoh. This is the torso of Sobek Neferu. Her belt is on her waist with the three Nefer signs and the crocodile of Sobek. She wears this shell around her neck, just like her father, and she's shown wearing a striped nemes. Just imagine how she would have looked if her head was still in place. She's here, in Paris. Sobek Neferu's legacy is spread throughout the world. You have to really try and piece together her life. That's what I'm going to try and do. As a woman, I find Sobek Neferu hugely inspirational. There must have been something exceptional about her that a tradition of male lineage was permitted to be broken in order for her to become the first recorded female pharaoh. Scattered between the twelfth dynasty pieces in Paris is this small female bust. She looks familiar. She has the the hair of Hathor. It, it's just incredible. She could be the Sobek Neferu, or her sister, Si Hathor. The exact identity of Si Hathor is disputed amongst Egyptologists. 
she is known to have been a princess. However, her father is speculated. Many items in her tomb come from three kings' reigns: Sesostris the Second, and the Third, as well as Amunemhat the Third. It is most likely that she was the daughter of Amunemhat the Third, since he is the most recent pharaoh named in her objects, making her the sister of Sobekneferu. She had a burial prepared in Amunemhat's pyramid. However, she was buried near Sesostris's pyramid. This is not uncommon for a royal to be buried next to another pharaoh's tomb. This is evident from the variety of 12th and 13th dynasty tombs in and around the pyramid of Amunemhat the Third at Dashur. The beautiful objects from Si Hathor's tomb include some of the most exquisite jewelry, earrings, bracelets, and more. A gold and inlaid pectoral necklace showing the throne names of Sesostris. Several necklaces and belts were also found with the fertility symbol of the cowrie shell dipped in gold. As well as a very 12th dynasty symbol, a seashell. It is the same kind that we see Sesostris and Amunemhat the Third wearing on their statues, as well as Sobek Neferu. What I'm looking at here is some jewelry from the 12th dynasty around the time of Queen Sobek Neferu and Sesostris the Third. And over there is a little shell, and that shell we can see often during the 12th dynasty. One item from Si Hathor's tomb draws my interest more than any other. This crown diadem, surrounded by flowers, with the two feathers of Amun and Mut on the back, with a cobra on the brow. I do not believe Si Hathor wore this. The cobra was reserved for the pharaoh and sometimes queens. Si Hathor was not a queen. At the Nemec, amongst the items found in the tomb of Neferu Ptah, the sister of Sobek Neferu, is a great example of a diadem worn by a princess, and in the Cairo Museum is a princess's silver diadem from the 12th dynasty. I believe this crown could have been worn by Sobek Neferu herself. Si Hathor, who could have outlived Sobek Neferu, could have been buried with the crown, as she was after all buried with objects from other rulers in the family. Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh from the 18th dynasty. She is often shown dressed in male attire. She often appears with a male body and wears the tie-on beard. These attributes are reserved for the pharaoh. They are symbols of divine kingship and are symbolic as such. By wearing the male items only demonstrates to the public that Hatshepsut was a pharaoh. Even the final Cleopatra is sometimes shown in male form wearing the male attire. A female pharaoh was not that readily accepted, which is why some female rulers presented themselves not only wearing the male adornments, but also in a male stylized body. This was to be accepted. However, Sobek Neferu did not do this. She wore the Nemez headcloth, but presented herself as a woman, a very bold move at the time for a female pharaoh. You know, at the end of the 12th dynasty, mm -hmm. then now there is no higher to the throne. Yes. In ancient Egypt, the rule is the king has to be a pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Women cannot be pharaohs. Yes. But a man, a man cannot be a pharaoh without women. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it doesn't mean that if women cannot be pharaohs, they are low. No. The Egyptian, when they saw Isis crying, after she lost Osiris, her tears were denied. Yeah. She raised the Horus to take the revenge from the devil. And therefore, at the end of the Middle Kingdom, there was no higher 
a pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And this is why Subic, Ferefro, as a queen, came to be, uh, I think, to be the, the second mm -hmm. woman to be ruled yes. after the old kingdom. Sobek Neferu continued her father's building projects in the oasis to cultivate new farming lands. She also took on several building projects that had not been completed by her father and brother in the Fayum. At the temple at Medinet Mahdi, dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek, we can find a very small and fragile remnant of the female pharaoh. This is the temple here at Medinet Mahdi, which is dedicated to Renenotet and Sobek. And what's interesting is, on the columns, we have the name of Amunemhat III, the father of Sobek Neferu. We have a little cartouche of Sobek Neferu over here, which I'll show to you in a second. Just around the corner, hidden away, Badly damaged from rain and from sand. If I climb up here, we have the cartouche of the first ever, possible first ever female pharaoh, Sobek Neferu. We see the three Nefers and the Sobek symbol at the bottom. Sobek Neferu, the great female pharaoh that ruled on behalf of her younger brother. As a pharaoh, she was named a pharaoh. This is one of the only remnants that we have of this obscure queen. It was here at the temple of Sobek, at Medinet Mahdi, that a cylinder seal of Sobek Neferu was discovered in 1868. The cylinder has the cartouche of the pharaoh shown with the crocodile god and the three nefer glyphs. Above that, she has the title of Nesut Biti, the ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt. As you roll it, we have her Horus name, which tells us that she is the daughter of the sun god that makes Horus joyful in the Upper and Lower Lands. On the other side, she's referred to as Sa'at Neb Tawi, Jed Neb Anktahoru, which means the daughter of the Lord of the Two Lands, the strength of the golden horizon of Horus. At Medinet Mahdi, several headless statues of Sobek Neferu were also discovered. She also made additions to the temple at Heracleopolis Magna. She also added an inscription at Amunemhat's mortuary temple, stating, This is a place for my father, for forever. Yet Sobek Neferu completed a very mysterious building project in Fayum, a project that was linked to the god of her namesake, a place that was massively important in her religious beliefs, one that has caught my attention. A temple built in the 12th dynasty by Amunemhat and continued by his daughter, the female pharaoh from the 12th dynasty, Sobek Neferu. Almost nothing remains of the original temple. The Greeks rebuilt it around 300 BC. Only one god is depicted here. The temple may seem small from the outside, but inside it hides many nooks and crannies. To the sides, are several small chambers. Exploring down the labyrinth of hallways, we can see that these walls were once decorated. The limestone has been chipped at by ancient Christian visitors seeking to erase the pagan texts. Much of this temple is a mystery, with several pits dug meters down. Water lines lead me to suspect that they were once pools to house crocodiles, connecting Sobek, the energy of the Nile, to this place. A bridge over a two-floor deep pit crosses over to three niches that contain the statues of the gods.
Crossing the bridge here is unique. I suspect it was to link you to the god Sobak, who lurked in the waters beneath your feet. The unlucky chosen priest was tasked with going down to leave offerings to the temple crocodile. The Greeks called this area Crocodiliopolis, the place of crocodiles. Here at this temple of Sobek, Sobek is a crocodile god known in the Fayum area. He was a god of war and protection for the pharaoh, and he was mentioned as early as the pyramid text, which we find in the fifth dynasty pyramids of Unas out at Saqqara. So he then later became part of the coffin texts as well, and later the Book of the Dead. On the roof of the temple is the only inscription still remaining, with its human body and wearing a feathered skirt holding a was scepter, appearing with a crocodile head, is Sobek, near a slit for light, connecting him to Ra. We're not actually sure why they even decided to build a temple to Sobek out here in this arid landscape with only the Fayum oasis to provide water. Was it to bring healing and protection to this area, yet this area is not a water area? Or was it to invoke the water god, Sobek, the god of the Nile, to direct the Nile to come and make this land fertile? But this temple raises more questions than answers. What evidence do we have that the ancient Egyptians kept crocodiles in the temple. I am traveling further south to get the answers. It is here at Komombo that another cult center of Sobek was established. This temple was mainly renovated during the Ptolemaic rule, with images having a Greek flair to them, and even some scenes showing the great female pharaoh Cleopatra. Sobek was a crocodile, and therefore he was seen as a god protecting the waters of the Nile. This temple is dedicated obviously to Sobek, the crocodile god, but also in part to Horus. And these two, when they came together, this temple was used in the later period, during the Greek period, as Almost like a hospital, people would come here to be healed. Sobek, over here, would then be considered to heal, you know, the skin and burns and things like that. But the Greeks believed Sobek was doing here when they transformed this temple into a hospital. And they then believed that Horus would heal the eyes. So these two gods came together here and were seen as healing deities, but before the Greek time, they had very different roles. It is at the back of Komombo Temple that we find proof of crocodiles being housed here. These pits at the back of Komombo are believed to be where they kept the temple crocodile. This would be one crocodile that embodied the spirit of Sobek. They kept them in here, and one priest had the lucky task of getting to put jewelry on this crocodile, and some of them even had painted nails. There are other pits around the temple as well that housed even bigger crocodiles. Many of these temple crocodiles were mummified when they died. These Nile crocodiles were divine after all. But these were kept in water, in sunlight at Komombo. But this doesn't answer my question about the water pits at Kasa Karun temple in Fayu. Could Sobek Neferu really have had Nile crocodiles in the dark waters below the temple that survived? To get the answers, I have traveled back to my hometown in South Africa to learn about the Nile crocodile. I'm meeting up with Ruan Hills, who spends his days surrounded by crocodiles.
Sobek Nefer. Her name means the beautiful one of the crocodile god. Okay. Yeah. And she built many temples dedicated to the crocodile god out in the Fayum Oasis. Mm -hmm. In this one temple, there's a little bridge towards the inner sanctuary. Okay. Underneath the bridge, there are two pits that go down, about two floors down. Now, we don't know what those were used for, okay. but some have suggested that they were filled with water mm -hmm. and the sacred crocodiles were housed in these pits. Okay. Now, how likely is, that, is it that they could have done that? I mean, can a crocodile survive without the sunlight like that for yeah. so long? Yeah. The, the, the big thing is crocodiles and what people have a misconception about reptiles in particular is with crocodiles eating whole animals. Yeah. They get the calcium and the stuff from the entire animal that they eat. They don't need as much vitamin D okay. to change the calcium, uh, to, to absorb the calcium okay. as other reptiles might like. Can they get that from just eating? Just from eating and digesting, yeah. So crocodiles are also probably one of the strongest stomach acids of any animal out there. Okay. So there is still research being done, but if I'm not mistaken, there's a small population of freshwater crocodiles somewhere in um, Australia yeah. that predominantly live in caves. Okay, and so they, they don't only see eat bats. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So obviously, because of that, those crocodiles have a much lighter skin tone. Yeah. So they are almost pure yellow crocodiles. Yeah. And um, because they don't need that thermoregulation of the black spots and and all of that, and also because it's dark, they don't need the camouflage either. Yeah. 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 So it is possible they could have housed these sacred crocodiles definitely, in these pits. Definitely. As long as the temperature stays more or less constant. Yeah. Then the crocodiles would actually They'll be okay. thrive. Yeah, if they get a constant supply of food, a constant temperature. So these crocodiles could survive in the dark. Definitely. So in here we've got about 2,800 new hatchlings. Yeah. So you can see as well, there's no natural sunlight in any of these stuff because for the first couple of years, it's more important to keep the temperature constant than it is for them to have natural sunlight. So we keep them in these hot houses for a year. Okay. And only after that we'll move, we move them out to the outside enclosures when okay. they tolerate the cold and the stuff a little bit okay. better. Yeah. And so this would be similar to what they did inside the temples with the covered ceiling, the pits like this. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most probably. Yeah. And they can survive then. Yeah, yeah. They, they flourish. I mean these crocodiles within a year, they're about sixty centimeters in length. Yeah. So, so they grow extremely fast during this time of the year. As soon as they're outside and they've got the external factors, the cold days and stuff, their metabolism slows down on the colder days, so they don't grow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can go outside. He's nice and strong. This little baby is about two years old now. This is now an American alligator. This is an alligator. This is so an alligator, yeah. So when it what, comes what to... What is the main difference? At the, at the moment, there's about 24 different recognized species of crocodilians. Okay. which they can classify into three to four groups. So you get your crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and then your gharials. Big, big difference between crocs and alligators, obviously, where the alligators would have a very round-shaped head. Crocs mm -hmm. have a very triangular yeah. V-shaped head. Yeah. Where do you want to go? You want to give it a hold? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, you can hear him listen to that? <laughs> yeah, so the big thing with him is as long as you keep the tail in line with the head, he's not going to wiggle too much because then he feels stable. Okay. Yeah. And you can put some pressure there on the neck as well. Hello. Hello, gorgeous. Because the big thing for them, it's all about balance. If the tail is in line with the head, yeah. then it feels balanced. It's not going to wiggle around yeah. too much. Just as soon as the tail dangles around, then it doesn't feel balanced. Sobek Neferu. Now, she built many of these temples mm. dedicated to the crocodile mm. god. She loved crocodiles. It was her namesake. Mm. Um, and many pharaohs after her took Sobek and put it into their names. I think it's about 13 pharaohs. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Sobek okay. Hotep, which means Sobek is happy. We read about how the ancient Egyptians used to care for the sacred crocodile. So okay. they had one in each temple dedicated to the crocodile mm. that was the sacred one. Okay. And there was a high priest that would go in and adorn the crocodile with jewelry okay. and gold and <laughs> rings and bracelets and yeah. things like that. We also read about them painting the crocodile's claws or nails. Okay. How tame can a crocodile become? L like I mentioned earlier on, crocodiles are wild animals. Regardless of how long you keep them in captivity, every opportunity they get, they will try to kill you in most cases. Mm -hmm. They are animals of habit though as well, and yeah. they can learn routines better than most other animals. Okay. 
Um, so it, it's, it's difficult to say that a crocodile can get tamed, but yeah. I have heard stories of people... Can they get used to people? Getting, yeah, yeah. They get used to people, get used to the feeling of touch and things like that. But I still won't go as close as keeping one in the bed next to me. Okay, or painting its nails. Yeah, yeah. Unless yeah. it's very cold, then, then it's all right. Yeah. If you, yeah. you drop a crocodile's core body temperature <laughs> to about 26 mm -hmm. degrees Celsius, 26 to 24 degrees Celsius, they become very, they become very lethargic. Yeah. Okay. Then you can literally sit on his back and brush his teeth and okay. do whatever you want to do, and he's going to lose that aggression. Okay. Because all so it would of have the, been possible. It would have been possible, definitely. Yeah. So this is a baby crocodile. A baby Nile crocodile. Yeah. Nile crocodile. Yeah. So this is this is baby Sobek. Yes, yeah. yes. And you know they used to. We don't know if they would sacrifice them, but sometimes they would take the young the young crocodiles, mm. and also mummify them. Okay. And inside this temple of Sobek Neferu in mm. the Fayum, on either side of the entrance, there's two, almost looks like post boxes. Okay. And they would slide mummified baby crocodiles <laughs> in there as an offering to Sobek. Wow. Sobek. He was the protector of the Nile, and later on he became the god of repairing the skin mm -hmm. um, underneath the, the Greek rule. Because obviously, you know, when a, a scale breaks off, they can they regenerate. regenerate. Exactly, yeah. So they yeah. saw a lot of interesting things about a crocodile, but in your opinion, what do you think they saw in these Nile crocodiles that they could have made them want to elevate a crocodile <laughs> Elevate a crocodile to a divine status. Wow. I think probably one of the the reasons is because of the fact that they are close to prehistoric. Yeah. So they've been on Earth longer than most other living animals, probably. Um, and also one of the facts that they are one of the most dangerous animals in the river systems in Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> By yeah. far, in except Africa. for in Africa, yeah. yeah. Ex except for hippos and stuff like that as well. So I think it it might have come out of a thing of fear mm -hmm. and they think that if they worship the animal that they fear more they will like a peace yes exactly yeah 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 so so to, to to get more respect for the animal so it yeah. doesn't attack them yeah yeah so you show the respect and then the animal will show you respect, respect back return, precisely something like that yeah, we, yeah, see, so we see that with um with the, the lioness goddess, second okay. okay. they feared her. Yes, yeah. So they deified her. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I assume it would have been the same with crocodiles, yeah. probably. Yeah. Protecting the water. Because Precisely. you go to the water, the crocodile comes out. Right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the more, and the, I think it, with most animals and most aspects of snakes and stuff like that, the same. There's a lot of new cosmetic products that are starting to come out as well, where they use crocodile fat and serums okay. to help with burn marks and stretch marks and lesions. That's and exactly like that. what they did at at the Komombo temple, they yes, would take yeah. extracts from the crocodiles. People are only now re-realizing it. Yeah. <laughs> they had it already. Exactly. You clearly spend almost every day, basically, with these crocodiles, right? Yes. With crocodiles, and one of the things I appreciate about them, unlike other animals that people can farm with, is the fact that a crocodile, regardless of how many years it's been in captivity, they stay wild animals. They do. They do. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you go swimming in this pond here behind us, the crocodiles will instinctively try and kill you. Yeah. Yeah. But crocodiles are, as you can see, not very active animals. Yeah. Most of the day, they literally lie and bask in the sun to try and maintain their body temperature. Can a crocodile differentiate between? Are the crocodiles, is there like a sense of community with them or are yes. they still very much... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crocodiles, it's funny mm -hmm. enough, they are, when it comes to reptiles, they are one of the only reptiles that show sense of community. Yeah. And even in long stretches of river, you would see batches of crocodiles of 50 or 60 crocodiles that would bask in the same bank. Okay. Even though there are kilometers of river bank available, they would still choose to bask yeah. together. Yeah. So there is a sense of community with them. You can see even these three crocodiles are a lot more scared of us than you would be on them. Mm -hmm. He's not happy. No. He's going to swing around for a gosh. <laughs> the longer you are about a meter and a half away from the head and the body and the tail, you are out of strike. Just to make it clear, when I started this documentary about Sovek Neferu, it was never the intention to get this close to a giant crocodile.
guy, just come a little bit close. Because if that guy chooses to swing He's around, stopped. yeah. yeah. We, can let him, we can move from the feet. This unplanned part of the shoot was definitely not the most comfortable interview I've ever done. Yeah. This is not my most comfortable interview. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're backing off more than me. Yes, you're no faster. the father of Sobek Neferu, Amunemhat III, shown here with a very slight waist, bigger hips, perhaps an indication of the times to come. It appears that at the end of Sobek Neferu's father's reign, Egypt was in a steady decline. The coffers had been abused and the funding began to run dry. Building projects slowed down, mining was reduced, and trade became limited. However, well before Amunemhat III's reign, the people began to complain about the declining economic conditions. The pharaoh decided to start giving concessional rule to noble men throughout Egypt, creating small, independent states that could have their own laws overseen by one man. We refer to these people as nomarchs. In Aswan, at Kubayt al-Hawa, are some tombs of these nomarchs. One nomarch at the start of the 12th dynasty showed his power. He created a deep tomb in the mountain and by carving himself on the facade of his tomb, on the outside of his tomb, he is shown performing scenes usually reserved for a pharaoh. Along with several harem women, he is accompanied by his son and his dogs. The name of Sarenput I is so clear here. We can see the goose or the duck, the mouth, the water, the box and the loaf of bread, and this spells out sa r n p u t sarenput. This man's successor, his nephew of the same name. He had a deep and beautifully decorated tomb carved into the mountainside. He had himself shown in the second hallway of his tomb in the form of a mummy. This was connecting him to the god of the next life, Osiris. He also wears a pleated headcloth and a falcon-tipped necklace. Surely this shows that he was trying to be shown as equal to the actual pharaoh. In the side chamber, we can see the human remains that have been located in Sarenput's tomb. You can see the remains of the top of a skull. But these bones are far too many to be one person. This tomb and many of the tombs at Kubayt al-Hawa were reused later on as mass burials, recycled as tombs for other people. So, apart from this one skull, there are lots and lots of other bones. All of these baskets are filled with bones. It's quite interesting because usually a tomb, you go in, you see it with all the lights on. You get a different feeling. When you see the actual human remains, it somehow humanizes the tomb. And it's, it's quite a moving experience to be so close to people that once lived, like you, like me, and here they are. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite something. This is the owner of the tomb, Sarenput. Here he is wearing a beautiful broad collar necklace. He's holding a staff 
and a scepter. Sarenput is a nomarch. So he ruled, but he wasn't royal. He is here welcoming his mummy coming into his tomb. And on here is his son. His name is Ankh Nura. Him and his son are depicted here in his tomb. As we go further down, we will see other family members of this man. He was of such a high status, he could afford a magnificent tomb such as this. Further down in his beautiful tomb, we can see him with his son and his wife receiving many offerings. And this piece here would have stood a statue of the man, of the nomarch. In front, offerings could be placed. His tomb, his actual burial is further down. And here we can actually see the workmen actually at work. Here's the grid that they used to create the perfect harmony in ancient Egyptian art. You can see the entire piece here that they, they just forgot to paint with this blue-gray color. Here is how they would have made the tomb. You can see by Sarenput they started to paint over the grid, yet they stopped. Did he die before the tomb was finished? Or did he run out of money? Or did the workmen just decide to stop? We don't know. But one piece that I find the most intriguing in Sarenput's tomb is this one. The beautiful man sitting here with his little goatee beard. And above, we can see the hieroglyph of an elephant, and with a little mound, and this N, this spells out Elephantine, the island that he ruled on, which is just across from these tombs at Kubayt al Hawa. He ruled at Elephantine, and there it's written. You don't often see an elephant in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And here we can see Khnum. Khnum was the god that Sarenput would have worshipped above all others at Elephantine. His name is written here in a cartouche as a royal. Now not Sarenput, he's now Nubhaura, which means this golden spirit of the sun, Sarenput. These nomarchs even established their own funerary cult and ensured that their family and priests would continue to leave them offerings. Sarenput was the nomarch of Elephantine, the island temple complex across from the tombs. One nomarch in particular, here named Hekaib, even had his own mortuary temple complex created, where he was to be worshipped after his death. Several men named Hekaib were worshipped here, even one from the reign of Sesostris III and Amunemhat III. During the co-regency of Sesostris and Amunemhat, the power of the nomarchs was slowly being extinguished may be due to the pharaoh seeing these people as too much of a threat to the actual rule of Egypt. It is at a site now called Beni Hassan that we rarely get a good idea of why by the time of Sobek Neferu's rule, Egypt was heading for disaster. High up on the hill of Beni Hassan, we can understand the beginning of the end of the Middle Kingdom. The tomb of the nomarch Amini at the start of the 12th dynasty shows us there was much rivalry between the Egyptians and the people to the north known as the Hyksos. These people from the area of Canaan fought many times against Egypt and eventually set up a peaceful settlement in the delta named Tavares, this was probably allowed by a corrupt nomarch. In another tomb, 
we can see this event taking place. In the tomb of the nomarch Khnum Hotep, we can come up close and personal with the nomarch and the Hyksos. These people are shown arriving from the land of Amu in Shu. The man on the right at the front is named as Abasha, and he is titled as the leader from foreign lands, also known as a Hyksos. On this wall, coming down here, with Khnum Hotep holding the bow with his pet dog in front, being flanked by Egyptians on either side while arriving in Egypt, are these people wearing foreign clothing? They, the patterns are not Egyptian. They don't look Egyptian from the hair and the beards. These people are arriving in Egypt before Khnum Hotep. You see the scribe at the front. He's presenting him with a piece of papyrus telling Khnum Hotep who these people are that are arriving. Khnum Hotep standing here with his short-legged dog and his staff before these foreigners. And the name of these foreigners is written right above this scene here with the mound and the little crook. And that spells out Hyksos, Hekanesu, Hyksos. These are the foreigners from the north arriving in Egypt who would eventually end up back at Avaras. These foreign people who settled in Avaris began to establish themselves more and more. So, by the time of Sobek Neferu's reign, they began to slowly infiltrate society. Many historians refer to the Middle Kingdom as Egypt's classical period, since we hear from many of the voices of the ancient people. The 12th dynasty saw a rise on power of nobles and people who served the pharaoh. It was not uncommon for noble families at the time to have male servants, butlers if you like. By the time of Sobek Neferu, we can see an increase in the use of Sobek in names, like this butler, Sobek Nihotep. And at the Museo Archeologico in Napoli in Italy is another statue of a butler from the 12th dynasty. This is the high steward during the 12th dynasty in the reign of Sesostris III. And he's shown in this full cloak. Apart from having a practical use, these cloaks often served ritual purposes and were worn during special occasions, like Sesostris wearing his cloak at his jubilee, or Nomark Barquette shown in his cloak. This is a very interesting scene. I first didn't know what it was, but as you can see, it is the man, Barquette. He's got his front leg here and his back leg here. His head is there, his arm is here, his hands are holding a staff you can see there, and he's got like a cloak or something over him. And he's, he's like crouching down, probably inspecting his land, because there's so much agriculture happening here, so maybe they wanted to depict something they saw this man actually doing one day. In New York, in the Metropolitan Museum, in their vast Egyptian collection, there is a small statue of a royal woman. She, too, is wearing a cloak and bears a striking resemblance to the Berlin statue of Sobek Neferu. Could this be her? And just days before bringing this documentary to a close, Dr. Mustafa Waziri announced the discovery of a 12th dynasty temple in the grounds of Luxor, revealing more about Sobek Neferu. Within the remains of the 12th Dynasty Temple, they discovered a granite bust of a queen. She closely resembles Sobek Neferu, including the same ears, hairstyle, and facial features. Maybe Sobek Neferu is finally wanting to tell her story.
Unfortunately, unlike Sesostris and Amunemhat III, Sobek Neferu did not rule long enough to celebrate a jubilee. There is a rock inscription at Semna in Nubia recording the Nile flood in the third year of her reign. And the Turin King's List Papyrus records her reign very precisely, three years, ten months, and twenty-four days. The King's List at Abydos in the Temple of Seti I from the 19th dynasty, however, excludes Sobek Neferu and other female pharaohs from the list of kings up to that point in time. Perhaps it was Seti's way of asserting that male rule was the only fully recognized form of pharaohship. Seti the first, standing here wearing the blue crown with the red cap tied at back, burning incense with his son, Prince Ramses the second. The names that are listed here starts with Pharaoh Meni, or Nama, as some refer to him. We have Titi, we go down the list, and we end up here at the fourth dynasty. We have Snefru, Khufu, Jedefra, Khafra. We go down through the dynasties. Kanefera, we have Pepi. We have all of these great pharaohs of ancient Egypt listed here with the names below of Seti Meren Pita, Seti, the one that pleases Pita, with his throne name here, Mat Men Ra, or Men Mat Ra, meaning the place of the justice of Ra. It is incredible that this continues. We have Ramses the first, Tutmosis the third, Tutmosis the fourth, Amenhotep the third, we then skip forward to Horemheb, Ramses the first again, because Ramses the first was around, we have him listed here twice, and we even have here, ending with the name of Seti. She is, however, mentioned at Karnak Temple in the King's List. We might not know much about her, but the limited number of statues and artifacts that have survived provide some fascinating insights into her life. We know she was depicted as a woman adorning a pharaoh's crown. She even dressed in male regalia, probably to assert her authority and uphold Egyptian tradition. Yet she did this while staunchly retaining her femininity. This speaks volumes about her ability to become a powerful woman in a social system that favoured a male line of succession. We do not know how Sobek Neferu died. Was she killed? She would have been quite young between the age of 25 and 35. She would have had good doctors and access to medical treatments at the time. She would have been in good health. It is possible that she was assassinated by a foreign ruler or by someone who did not agree with a woman being a pharaoh. All images of Sobek Neferu have been damaged, a clear sign of erasure. Nevertheless, Sobek Neferu tried her best to maintain Egypt and given more time, she may have been able to prevent what was to happen next. With the ruling pharaoh Sobek Neferu now dead and no heirs to take up power, a new set of rulers were to come in, the 13th dynasty, with a long list of pharaohs using Sobek in their names. A temple doorway from Pharaoh Sobek Hotep. Now, there were several pharaohs named Sobek Hotep. It was a name that was reused, reused, reused. And we can see the name here with the cartouche, not the original cartouche that was taken out. You can see it's deeper, obviously Dynasty 13 leaving their mark. Yet Sobek Neferu was to be the last pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom. 
Shortly after her death, Egypt was divided yet again, with nomarchs taking up power again in their regions, and the Hyksos from the north gaining momentum. Eventually, only a few years after she had died, Egypt was in complete chaos. With no real royal bloodline to rule, the Hyksos started their rule in more regions of Egypt, and the actual Egyptians were being oppressed and suffered greatly for over 150 years, a far cry from the glory of the 12th dynasty. What of Sobek Neferu's tomb? She never had time to build a pyramid. One structure at North Mazguna is suggested to be her unfinished pyramid. However, there is absolutely no evidence of this. There is, however, a place that is most possibly the site of her burial. On our way to go see the Black Pyramid. The Black Pyramid was built by Amunemhat III. It was one of two that he had made. Both served as a burial site for many of his family members. However, there are two extra burial chambers inside the Black Pyramid. We do not know who was buried in them, but it is highly possible that Amunemhat IV and Sobek Neferu were buried in these chambers. If there was no time to build their own pyramid, it was seen as perfectly normal to be buried alongside a predecessor's pyramid in the 12th dynasty. Even a pharaoh from the 13th dynasty named Hora Wibra was interred in this pyramid. The Black Pyramid behind me was the final resting place for three separate pharaohs. Yet another pharaoh was placed into Amunemhat and Sobek Neferu's pyramid, and his name was Hor Awibra. Hor Awibra was a pharaoh in the 13th dynasty, shortly after the end of Sobek Neferu's rule in the 12th dynasty. He had a simple shaft tomb in the side of the Black Pyramid. And inside here, we find some of the most beautiful examples of Middle Kingdom burials inside a pyramid. We have his beautiful car statue surrounded by bowls. And then we have the sarcophagus with the body of the Pharaoh and, of course, his death mask which was made out of copper and blue glass. This is the mummy of Pharaoh Hor Awibra, buried with the crook and the flail around him, his arms down with beautiful jewelry. Now, when they removed the death mask from his head, his skull came with. So when we see the death mask on display in the Cairo Museum, the Pharaoh's skull is still inside the death mask and he is one of few examples that we have to prove that pharaohs were indeed buried inside a pyramid. At the Cairo Museum, the treasures of Hora Wipra can be marveled upon. This beautiful statue of the pharaoh is known as the Ka statue. The Ka was the ancient Egyptian form of the spirit symbolized by the two open arms which are placed on his head. Made of wood, he has areas once gilded in gold, like his necklace and fingernails. He would have had a linen skirt attached to cover the detailed midriff area. He wears the Osiris beard to show that he has joined the god of the afterlife. His eyes are by far the most captivating. They are inlaid with precious stones, giving them a realistic appearance of having blue eyes. 
The pharaoh is stepping out of a shrine. The shrine was to symbolize his spirit coming and going from his tomb at the edge of the Black Pyramid. Other treasures were found inside his tomb, like a miniature form of his car statue and many other pieces of exquisite jewelry. Many of his walking sticks and staves, and interestingly, five canopic jars, rather than the traditional four, as well as several jars containing the sacred oils. His mummy was badly deteriorated, yet his death mask is simply spectacular. Made from wood, it was once gilded in gold. He has a short beard made from blue faon's tiles. On his brow is the hole where his regal cobra was once inserted, and his eyes have been lovingly inlaid with stones to be as realistic as possible. Just think that Hora Webra's skull is still inside this mask. All of this discovered in the place where Amunemhat and Sobek Neferu were also laid to rest, the Black Pyramid. Inside the museum, we can also find the capstone of this pyramid. It has the intricate name of Amunemhat III carved around it. This was once placed at the very top of the pyramid. It was pushed off and damaged during the reign of Akhenaten, which was actually a gift for us to then enjoy it close up. But this stone is not of this earth. It was created out of a meteor, adding to the heavenly meaning behind being buried in a pyramid. This imposing structure was to be the last giant pyramid built in Egypt. The start of the intermediate period after Sobek Neferu's death also marked the end of pyramid building, as by then pyramids were being looted by the suffering population. In its day, the Black Pyramid would have looked much different than it does today. It was made from this mud brick because vast building projects were becoming time-consuming and greatly straining the waning Egyptian economy. This pyramid is built out of mud brick. Many of the mud bricks have crumbled away. You can see here, this is the construction method. Mud and straw to construct a pyramid. The last pyramid built before they started using tombs. I'm going to take you up this magnificent structure from the 12th dynasty. Tourists don't come here, so I feel extremely privileged to finally see this pyramid. Let's go. At the top of this pyramid, I found a few clues which could help us understand the erosion. Yes, 3,800 years of wind and sand has chipped away at it. You can feel the intense wind swirling around it, yet there is a more human side to its decay. I noticed that there are several pieces of broken ancient pottery. These were usually left at sacred sites by people coming to honor the dead. It appears to me that pilgrims coming to this pyramid, instead of leaving the pots at the base, easily climbed up the step-like mud brick and left their offerings at the summit. Thousands of years of visitors wanting to offer to the gods and their pharaonic ancestors climbing up the crumbling pyramid seems to be a very touching thought. This place contained not only the spirits of Amunemhat III and his family, the spirit of Sobek Neferu, 
but also the spirit of the people of Egypt. Egypt.